Hey there, students. I'm going to go ahead and talk to you about the 19th century isms. This goes out to Mr. Gut's class and also to Taylor, who, according to Instagram, can't wait to see this lecture. Hope it lives up to your expectations, Taylor. Uh, this is supposed to be kind of a review. I'm going to talk about a lot of these isms in more detail. I've already got a lecture on Romanticism, another one on Romantic art. I plan to follow up with classical liberalism, got the Congress of Vienna and all that kind of stuff. But if you're preparing for your exam, then you want to know a bit about each of the 19th century isms. Now, I've got a graphic organizer available on my website. If you go to TomRitchie.net, then you can follow along with me. I've got a little thing where you can fill out, uh, probably put a link to that right here or something like that, so that you can go to my website and follow along as we go over the six isms of the early 19th century. And I'm going to throw up some graphic organizers here, and I might just kind of make myself small and kind of travel around them or something like that. We'll see. Uh, once I start editing it. Now, first of all, you need to remember, just forget what you think about conservatism, liberalism, romanticism, socialism, nationalism, feminism, as far as if you've heard those words in the context of 21st century America, because we're looking at 19th century Europe. So keep that in mind that when your exam asks about uh, you know, these isms, and especially in the context of the 19th century, a lot of them mean something very different than they would mean today. So throw that out and just go ahead, just listen to what I tell you, and let's make sure you're successful on your test. I'm going to start off with conservatism. Conservatism attracted predominantly the aristocracy and the landed gentry. Uh, these are the people who held a lot of property under the old regime. Buzzwords here, tradition institutions, privileges, all right? These are people who really defended the old regime and saw some value here um, in what was what was left here. You think about really the French Revolution and how you see that, okay, when all of this unravels, look, look what happens. Now, conservatism sometimes mixes well with romanticism because it's a backward-looking movement, okay? It's just like, uh, you know, the times back then, they were better than the times now. That might sound a little bit like American conservatism nowadays. And liberalism, socialism, nationalism, not so much because these are not stable. These are different propositions for a new order to fill the old void of the conservative order. Now, sometimes conservatives might play well with liberals for a little bit if it means to combat socialism. You do see throughout European history in the 19th, maybe in the early 20th centuries, where these parties get together because they want to stifle socialist or labor parties and parties of that vein um, because of that. Edmund Burke and Metternich would be your two biggest proponents of conservatism. Edmund Burke wrote his Reflections on the Revolution in France, uh, where he is writing about how the liberalism of the French Revolution really is what is responsible for toppling the order that existed there before. Moving on to liberalism. Now keep in mind we're talking about 19th century classical liberalism here. And this attracted the bourgeoisie, the professional class, uh, you know, really kind of the upper middle class, white collar, especially people who are factory owners and merchants and people like that. Lots of buzzwords for classical liberalism. First of all, keep in mind that liberalism comes from the root word liberty. Laissez-faire economics, uh, which is different than how we think of economic liberalism in the United States, but uh, similar as to what you would see as economic liberalism today in Europe. Reform. Uh, they are all about taking what's there and reforming it into something something else, really to fit more with the times. Constitutions. Uh, liberals love constitutions, the idea of constitutional rights. They like choices, whether that be in the economy or whether that be in society. Individualism. Individualism is really what sets liberalism apart from conservatism and socialism and nationalism, really, which all view people as groups. Uh, even feminism uh, is, you know, about women. Liberalism is different from all of these because it places the first importance on the individual. Natural rights, life, liberty, and property. 
equality. Now, of course, uh, liberals and socialists uh, and feminists will all talk about equality. Liberals have a certain definition here of equality, really equality of opportunity as they see it, uh, you know, that the law, the government should just kind of stay out of things. Very limited government type of philosophy. And progress. Keep in mind that liberalism doesn't necessarily get along as well with conservatism or romanticism uh, because those or backward-looking movements. Liberalism is a forward-looking movement. Uh, mixes well with nationalism because nationalism is all about self-determination and different ethnic uh, groups and cultural groups being able to decide that they want to be under the same government. That government should be the result of a choice, not a result of conquest or domination or something like that. Doesn't really play well with conservatism, romanticism, and its opposite, socialism. Now, keep in mind, a lot of times we see liberalism and socialism interchanged in the United States today, but uh, they're really at opposite ends of the spectrum when we're talking about Europe, especially in the 19th century. Proponents here are Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill, who wrote Wealth of Nations and On Liberty, respectively. And just to compare conservatism and liberalism very quickly, conservatives look at rights as inherited, that you have your rights because of a connection with the past, all right? That, uh, you know, I have freedom of religion, not uh, because it's natural, as a liberal would see it, that this freedom is natural or God-given. A conservative would say, you've got this right because you're used to having this right. It is a traditional right. You have rights because of a connection with the past. Um, Edmund Burke is sometimes referred to as a liberal conservative because while Burke uh, believed in conservatism in the sense of preserving institutions and not reforming and dismantling uh, very quickly in a short amount of time, um, he did uh, in, some, in a lot of cases support just generally liberal values. For example, he supported the American Revolution and he said, look, that these people, they have the Magna Carta, they have the English Bill of Rights, they have this tradition of having a representative body. Um, and participating in their government, whereas the French didn't have anything like that. Whereas, you know, when you look back at the Glorious Revolution in England in the 1680s, you see that that modified existing institutions. It just altered the balance of power between king and parliament, which already existed. Whereas the French Revolution destroyed existing institutions, the decrees of August 4th, bam, it's all gone. The nobility, <laughs> snap. Uh, destroyed existing institutions and then created brand new institutions and in a very short amount of time getting rid of one institutional structure and then replacing it with another which in the views of conservatives this is what brought the French Revolution uh, kind of going in all that crazy stuff with the heads coming off and all of that. Next up we have Romanticism. Now Romanticism largely was uh, a product of the artistic class. Authors, artists, poets, people like this uh, who tend to have a more artistic sort of vibe about them. They're into beauty and nature, nostalgia, and also they do not like the values of the Enlightenment. Now keep in mind liberals uh, in the 19th century, they are the ones who are kind of the banner carriers of the Enlightenment. They're taking Enlightenment values into the 19th century and that's why liberals and romantic Romantics uh, didn't really get along that well because liberals supported industrialization. This is technology. This is good. Romantics did not. They did not see technological progress being synonymous with human progress. And keep in mind, I've got a few lectures on Romanticism that are already on YouTube if you want to take a look at those. Romanticism can mix well with conservatism because, as again, it's backward looking. Uh, then nationalism because, you know, people wanting to be under their own government with people like them and their religion and the Greeks not wanting to be dominated by the Turks and all that kind of stuff. That's beautiful, man. That's just so beautiful. And, you know, romantics just got into that. These people are fighting for their rights. Gosh, it's just, just so great. Doesn't play well with liberalism. Again, one of the big sticking points being the liberals' uh, support of the Industrial Revolution, uh, which the romantics did not like at all. 
proponents are people like William Blake, a poet, and Eugene Dela, Delacroix or something like that. Uh, however, it's a written test. So, uh, yeah, I don't speak French well. If you don't either, then uh, we're just in the same boat. Uh, now, documents, things like The Sorrows of Young Werther, which is about uh, a young man who is in love with a woman and she's engaged or married or something like that. And he can't have her and he's just like, man, can't have the woman I want. Bam, okay, I'm going to blow my brains out because I'm just so in love. Don't do that, okay? That's just that's just stupid. Um Frankenstein, uh, you know, which, you know, when you look at the Enlightenment, like science can fix everything, but Dr. Frankenstein wants to play God. You know, science gone wrong. Uh, William Blake's poetry, especially when he talks about the dark satanic mills of the Industrial Revolution. Moving on to nationalism. Now, nationalism is a bit different because all social classes are involved here because the whole premise of nationalism is that nationality transcends class structures, that we should look at ourselves as Germans or as Italians or something like that and not as, you know, as Greeks and not as being a member of this class or that class or the other class. Buzzwords here, spirit or what they, what some people call vault. Volksgeist, Volksgeist, something like that. Uh, the spirit of the the folk, uh, the folk spirit, the people spirit, uh, this this group spirit here. Um, freedom and also independence. Now keep in mind that's why nationalism and liberalism can play well with each other because of this value of freedom and independence and self-determination and choice. Mixes well with liberalism um, because of the self-determination and romanticism because of the beauty and ideals of, uh, of the romantics. Doesn't play well with conservatism uh, because nationalism destabilizes. Uh, conservatives value not only na not only stability between states but also within states and when you have these nationalist movements it gets in the way of the status quo. You have very quick changes coming, lots of instability. The French Revolution had an element of nationalism so the conservatives are not very big into this at all. Proponents of nationalism uh, would be Mazzini in Italy and Hegel, who was a German philosopher, uh, famous for his uh, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, actually wrote that, uh, you know, Germany was so disunified, thesis, that eventually the antithesis was going to happen, that Germany would become unified. Uh, so he sort of, uh, sort of prophesied this through philosophy. And Mazzini wrote uh, The Duties of Man, which uh, Mazzini wrote that you've got a duty to your God, your family, your country, all right? And really, it's like God gives you your country so that you can perform your duty to God, uh, that God sees you not just as an individual, but sees you as an Italian, and he gives you that nation as the means by which to perform his will. Also, Grimm's fairy tales, uh, you know, I was reading into this, and, and this is interesting because I've heard these stories when I was little, but you notice in a lot of Grimm's fairy tales, I mean, it's isn't Hansel and Gretel one of those? Watch that not be one of them, and I just look like an idiot. But, you know, all these German names come up. Uh, you know, the Brothers Grimm, they're going through uh, Germany, what's today Germany, and they're collecting folk tales, okay? You know, Volk, you've got this uh, Volksgeist and all of that. And really, the premise here is that, look, we all tell the same stories to our children. These are our stories. These are folk tales. These communicate our national spirit. Uh, so, you know, interesting just to look at uh, Grimm's fairy tales as a bit of, uh, you know, a nationalistic sort of endeavor. And here you can see in Eugene Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People, uh, you see a combination of nationalism and romanticism. Uh, you see the flag here, you see, uh, you know, little kid with guns, that's not safe uh, or anything like that. Don't try that at home. Uh, but it, it makes this whole like French nationalist movement just look so beautiful. And so keep in mind that nationalism or romanticism are often combined. There's also a lot of art and poetry having to do with the Greek independence movement. Wah!
right, yeah. <laughs> oh, just in case you fall asleep, time to talk about socialism. All right, gonna gonna scare some of you. Uh, you know, it's sort of a scary word in the uh, in the United States, but uh, it was a scary word in Europe uh, at the time. I mean, these socialists are you know talking about these really radical upheavals to society. Uh, you know, socialism was something that was uh, meant to reach out to the working classes. Now, of course, they had their instigators amongst the bourgeoisie and sometimes the aristocracy, but this philosophy is really targeted toward the working classes and the dispossessed classes, the classes that don't, uh, you know, get to benefit as much from these liberal reforms that are happening and certainly not from the conservative old regime. Now, socialism, uh, lots of buzzwords here, justice, equality, and fairness. Now, this equality is not just kind of like, hey, you know what, the government, the government's just going to stay out, all right, and we're going to kind of let the whole state of nature thing sort of play out with some modifications. Uh, you know, just everybody duke it out. The government's not going to give anybody any privileges. Uh, but socialists believe that, uh, you know, in order to promote fairness, that equality, like government has an obligation, uh, society has an obligation to help people become equal, not just the old liberal, like, all men are created equal, but there should be an equality that is uh, purposeful. And that society, you know, whereas liberals would favor competition, uh, you know, socialists would say that what they seek to do is create a society that is based on harmony and cooperation and association that, uh, you know, laissez-faire competition may not be the best way to promote society or the interest of society, you know, we need organization and we need community, um, that uh, it shouldn't just be about the individual, but it should be about the group. And finally, this idea of freedom, which uh, which is interesting, because I heard somebody lecturing on Marx one time, and while we associate Marx with communism and despotism, that sort of thing, you know, what Marx is really trying to get at is human freedom, that he really did not see in this new liberal order that was put in place by the industrial revolution. So keep that in mind that it's just a different concept of freedom uh, depending on how you define all of these words. Socialism, uh, you know, socialism is kind of the red-headed stepchild of this whole thing. Uh, there are different groups that will play around with socialism and kind of throw it in there, you know, for effect or something. But really, when it comes down to it, socialism doesn't really play well with a lot of these uh, isms. Perhaps some romantics who think that it's beautiful to start some kind of utopian community or something like that. But but other than that, it's, it's just, uh, you know, people will employ socialism here and there, but it's not really, you can't really just pair it with something. Um, doesn't play well, especially with conservative, conservatism and liberalism. Do not put uh, those uh, little ones in the same uh, in the same playpen together. It'd be like throwing like Tommy Pickles like in a playpen with like Raptor or something like that. Uh, proponents would be Louis Blanc, who was an early French uh, socialist, and of course Karl Marx, author of the Communist Manifesto. Louis Blanc wrote a book called Organization of Work. Now keep in mind that the liberals would say laissez-faire, invisible hand. <laughs> See what just happened to my hands? Oh, they're invisible. Just kidding. They're not invisible, but I'm pretending like they are. All right, but uh, anyway, whereas the liberals would be like, oh, you know, just let society, let the work organize itself. Let the invisible hand work. Louis Blanc says we need to organize work. We need to work as a society to make sure that everybody has a job and that sort of thing. Uh, Louis Blanc pioneered the setting up of national workshops in France where somebody who didn't have a job could go get a job in one of these government workshops. Um, you know, what good that did, I, I don't know, but, uh, you know, I guess it made people feel better about themselves. And I just want to talk about something real quick that I talk about with my own students a lot, and I think they find it helpful. They could just be like, yeah, Richie, yeah, that's really helpful, uh, right? But, but anyway, I really think that it's important to talk about the uh, the relationship between conservatism, liberalism, and socialism, and why these uh, these philosophies, uh, you know, what what they're really trying to do is that conservatism is the old regime, and it's based on group privilege. You know, that I'm a member of the clergy or the nobility, or you know, maybe I was a member of a merchants guild or a workers guild or something. That society was organized into several groups, each group having its own privileges and that sort of thing. Well, both liberals and socialists 
socialists sought to abolish this whole system of privilege. So if we're you know comparing liberalism and socialism, there's not much that they have in common at this time, but they do have in common the sense that they are rebelling against this system of aristocratic privilege, uh, liberals and socialists both. Now, of course, uh, liberalism is selling this alternative that let's reorganize society on the basis of individualism, every man for himself, uh, instead of having these privileged groups. Uh, you know, like give everyone the same equal rights and let them uh, live their lives as they see fit. Now, socialists would seek to reorganize organize this on the basis of collectivism, that you abolish group privilege and then you throw everybody into the same kind of pot. So they both believe in abolishing privilege and having equality under the law, but then again, you know, socialists would look at liberalism and they would say, well, that's just really money privilege. You're, you're replacing hereditary privilege with money privilege, which is effectively what we have in America today. Um, you know, the more money you have, the more opportunity, opportunity you have and all of that kind of stuff. Now, as I said, conservatives and liberals, uh, they would uh, band together against socialism sometimes because they shared this belief in private property, which uh, that's really the big thing about socialism, that they don't believe in private property. Uh, and so that threatens uh, both types of property, both the conservative landed gentry, aristocratic types, and the liberal uh, professional types uh, who also have their uh, form of property that they find uh, special uh, and all of that and helps them. So just keep that in mind that socialism was unpopular in both fronts, but both socialism and liberalism were the alternatives to replacing this old regime. Don't worry, Abigail Adams, I did not forget about the ladies. Let's talk about feminism. Now, of course, we've mentioned all of these things where, you know, let's, uh, organize society on the basis of the individual, uh, you know, an entire group. Uh, let's look at nationality. Let's look at what's beautiful. Uh, let's look at what's traditional. But in a lot of cases, people aren't really thinking about uh, women who, you know, they're half of us and they've been discriminated against and really had no rights, not only under the old regime, but weren't really getting uh, a lot better treatment under the new regimes that are being set up. It's not going to be till the 20th century that women can vote. Uh, and the buzzwords here, uh, women want to get rid of gender privilege, uh, which men at the time had, you know, the privilege of being educated, the privilege of voting, the privilege of owning property in their own right. Uh, in some cases, the privilege for initiating a divorce. Uh, you know, so there are a lot of rights that, that women did not have and feminism is really starting to take shape in the 19th century. The French Revolution uh, is where you first start to see, uh, you know, feminists uh, start to show themselves. So in the 19th century, we do have, uh, for the first time in European history, a pretty viable feminist movement. And they want to replace gender privilege with gender equality uh, based on natural rights. Uh, feminism mixes well in a lot of cases with liberalism. In some cases, socialism, uh, because socialism, uh, you know, in, in some of its uh, forms, uh, advocates uh, gender equality. Now, keep in mind that feminists employed these philosophies. That's not to say that liberalism was... Uh, was feminist in tone, or a lot of the liberals championed women's rights, although some did. Uh, of course, feminism doesn't play well with conservatism because uh, in the conservative order, you didn't see a role for women in the public sphere. Um, your biggest proponents would be Mary Wollstonecraft and John Stuart Mill. Um, a Vindication of the Rights of Woman being Mary Wollstonecraft's book after she defended the French Revolution, she decided to write a book about women's rights and John Stuart Mill wrote The Subjection of Women uh, because, uh, you know, his wife Harriet was a real smart lady and she actually helped him a good bit on this book. Uh, of course, Mary Wollstonecraft and um, Harriet Mill, they've both been my WCW on Instagram and all that kind of stuff, uh, that sort of thing. I like them a lot um, and they, they've got a, got a lot to say here about, you know, hey, I mean, especially with liberals who are saying we need equal rights and we need to organize society 
society based on the individual. What about the individuality of women? Uh, and so the feminist movement is, uh, you know, over the next uh, hundred years going to culminate uh, with women finally voting uh, after World War I uh, and, you know, being able to own property, being able to receive a university um, education. Uh, so I'll talk more about feminism in another video. And that wraps up our talk about the isms. Hopefully this was a good review for you. Um, if it was and you'd like to see more, if you just stumbled across this video, subscribe to my channel, visit my website, TomRitchie.net, Twitter, Instagram, all of that kind of stuff. I'll be back to talk about some more AP Euro and history topics and all that kind of stuff. But for now, I'm out. Until next time.